Mandated reporting gets a lot of attention these days because it seems like an absolute no-brainer. But this policy actually makes it harder for the kids who need help to get it. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Saints and Scripted. On today's episode, I want to give a disclaimer. We're going to be talking about something more serious, abuse. Today, I'm joined by a special guest. This is Jennifer Mm -hmm. Roach. She's a licensed mental health counselor, a senior researcher for FAIR Latter-day Saint, a convert to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and a survivor of abuse herself. So you wrote a very, very fascinating article for Public Square magazine. Mm -hmm. It's titled, I Know How to Lower (laughs) Church Abuse Rates by 75%. Yeah. So a big debate from the recent case is that should there be an increase in mandatory reporting laws? Could you let us, could you tell us a little bit on what mandatory reporting laws are yeah. and why people think there should be an in- increase in them and what your opinion is? Yeah. So I'm a mental health therapist. Mm-hmm. I'm under the mandated reporting laws. If someone says something to me that reveals information about child sexual abuse, vulnerable adult abuse, things like that, I have a legal responsibility to call Child Protective Services and report what I know. They are the ones who get to decide if an investigation is warranted or if it isn't. My job is to call. Their job is to investigate. Mandated reporting is the latest in kind of a long line of policies that we have thought are going to cure child sexual abuse. It goes all the way back to like the 70s. There were introductions of if we just do this, it will be fine. Um, In the 80s, it was... If we just make sure there's only one or that there's not just one teacher in a classroom, nobody's going to abuse children in in front of another adult. That will never happen. The the Larry Nasser case proves exactly like he's the he's the physician for the women's gymnastic team, the U.S. national team. They're all teenagers at the time. He abuses more than half of them and sometimes does it while their parents are in the room. Mm. Right. So, okay, too, too deep leadership is now not the magic bullet we thought it was. Right. We thought um, background checks would be it. Background checks are not it. Mandated reporting gets a lot of attention these days because it seems like an absolute no-brainer. Mm-hmm. A pastor or a priest or a bishop has someone in their office. They confess some version of, of abuse to them. The thinking is, well, that bishop should pick up the phone immediately, call Child Protective Services, like, practically on the spot. The logic of that makes sense. However, here's what happens in reality. Two things. One, many states have gone through the process of instituting mandatory reporting. And what happens is, say the level of cases is is right about here without mandated reporting. So this is just cases that they find through whatever means. When mandated reporting starts... Those cases go up about tenfold, but the actual number of abuse cases remains identical. Mm, so just to clarify, the number of cases reported increases, but the number of confirmed cases, meaning cases where people are convicted or there's substantial evidence, doesn't increase at all. Even case, It's even cases where they choose to do an investigation. Wow. So they can – that stays exactly the same. So – the extra reporting that's being done, to be honest, this is it's so heartbreaking to say because everybody who wants this policy is caring about kids. Right. And everyone here is trying to figure out how do we get help to kids. But this policy actually makes it harder for the kids who need help to get it. Mm. Because now overworked CPS worker who already was overworked, if they get their mandated, they have to sort through 10 cases. And then they're spending more time dismissing reports yes. than actually finding the kids who are in dangerous situations. Yeah. So that's that's the first reason it it just doesn't work. Right. Um, second reason is there's a number of studies um, actually done with nurses. Mm-hmm. So there's kind of a, an idea of like if you see another nurse doing something that's dangerous, you really like you need to say something, right? It's patient right. safety. You need to report her. In some situations, nurses were given this as encouragement. Please, we want to know we, this, this nurse needs to be retrained, whatever. Um, and that went along and worked fine. And lots of people ended up getting retraining so that they could be safer around patients. When mandated reporting happens for nurses on each other, reporting disappears. Really? They stop doing it. 
because people are way more careful now about what they're saying that they're doing. They're way more hiding. And these are nurses nurturing people who went into that career to help, like Mm -hmm. all these things. So imagine the sexual abuser who might, might, might maybe say something to their religious leader. That's going to disappear if mandated reporting applies across the board to to clergy. Because they're going to know that if they say something, yeah. it is without a shadow of a doubt going to be reported. Yes. Because you know what? I'm a therapist. Those people don't come sit in my office. Mm, right. Because they don't want to admit to it. Because they know exactly what I have to do. Mm-hmm. And I have to do it whether I want to or not. Right. So clergy is this weird little intersection of... The person can say something to them in confidence, and that clergy person has an opportunity to use their influence, to use their help, to use whatever to maybe figure out how to make some movement so that it can be reported. And in these cases, this most recent one, a big one from last summer, you see the clergy trying to do that, begging these people, please, like, let's do this, and then, like, figuring out how to get them to report. And sometimes it works. And sometimes it doesn't work, but they're still able to help the family and make accommodations for the family. And right. So all of that disappears. If we put mandatory reporting laws into place. Yeah. There, there is actually a, a third interesting wrinkle in mandated reporting. Okay. Last year in California, they introduced a law that didn't pass in the, the California Assembly at the time, but it was close and it probably will pass again. It was backed by... All of the big groups who are advocates for LBGTQ, for immigrants, for all kinds of vulnerable groups, that law asked for a reduction in mandated reporting when it comes to medical professionals, Mm -hmm. meaning the victim should get some say. They should. Into what happens. And, And right now in a lot of places, they don't, even if they're an adult. Wow. They don't get a say over what's happening in their own life. Now, nobody's saying, oh, we should just let these children suffer. Right. Like literally no one is saying that. But at the same time, an adult who reports a crime, they go to the emergency room because they've been sexually assaulted. They should have some agency over what happens with that. Right. Otherwise, do they go get medical help if they know it's going to get reported and they don't want it? No, they're not. No, because they're less trusting. It can be really detrimental to mental health to know that your situation is going to be reported without your consent before you're ready for that. Because as soon as it gets reported and it goes through, that's going to lead to change whether you like it or not or you're ready for it or not. It's out of your hands at that point. There's Mm -hmm. nothing you can do about it. And there's nothing that you could do about getting it reported, even if you're an adult. Not in every scenario, but in some scenarios. And that just... Like we've kind of overstepped the mark on that a little bit. So lots of groups like this law in California, they're trying to pull it back and be like, wait, let's be more reasonable and not actually make victims' lives harder. Right. Absolutely. So we've covered that mandatory reporting doesn't really do more good than is already being done. In some cases, it actually causes more harm for children. I remember reading the article that in Pennsylvania and New York, it led to an increase in child deaths yes. from abuse because they were a- they were less able to get to those kids in time due to the surplus of reports that were coming in yep. and needed to be dismissed. Yeah. Now, I really appreciate how you brought up that people's situation will be reported before they are ready for it Mm -hmm. to be reported. Because in the article, it also stated that a child is 3.5 times more likely to say that such a law made things worse than it made things better. Because once CPS gets involved or once social services or any Mm -hmm. other other organization gets involved, it can actually make things worse. It can make changes that people aren't ready for mentally. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Child protection is something everybody cares about. We've pushed a lot of policies that don't actually accomplish that Mm -hmm. as spoken by victims themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the things that's really kind of weird in the victim like advocacy space is sometimes it's victims' voices that get marginalized and everybody else knows better. Now, I'm not saying a six-year-old should be in charge of their life. But in that statistic you gave, these are adults looking back on what Child Protective Services did. And and as adults are saying, this didn't turn out really good for me. In fact, they made my life worse. Um, So I would love to see way more victim-directed kind of responses where Mm. that individual person's circumstances are taken more into consideration. 
I would also love to see some kind of empowerment for um, professionals like me who are mandated reporters to do some kind of ethical decision making tree that says this case should be reported. And this is something that sounds like it might be abuse, but I also know enough context to know that it's not. Mm. And therefore, I'm not going to report it, but I'm not in danger of losing my license either. I see. Because there's things I have reported um, that I knew perfectly well because I knew the broader context. It was extremely unlikely that it was an active abuse scenario. But the client said some of the keywords that they need to say in order to get something reported and I had no choice. And that is one of the superfluous cases that now a worker has to sort through and can't find the actual victims. I think more victim-led and um, mental health professional-led mm-hmm. changes in the system would allow for what people are looking for, which is a uh, higher prevention of these types of things from mm-hmm. happening in the future without creating laws that are actually going to harm people in the yes. long run. Yes. Yes. Uh, There was a quote in the article that I want to read to you and get your thoughts on as well. We should be extremely cautious that our outrage is not translated into advocacy for policies that not only don't adequately protect children, but may ultimately be harmful. This is the case I argue for calls to expand mandated reporting. And I just wanted to know if you had anything to add on to that, because it's true that when we see cases like this, we're hurt, we're Mm -hmm. sad, we're disappointed, and we're angry. And we want change and we want it now because we want to stop this from happening. Mm -hmm. But what seems like the clear-cut surface-level good solution isn't always that when you look at the details and you look at the data. Yeah, I wish that there was one silver bullet, one thing that we could do, and if that would just get implemented, this problem would go away. And in 40 years of of working on this topic as a society, abuse has stayed roughly the same level. Like, Mm -hmm. we we haven't made a dent in it. I do see then how like having the victims and mental health professionals lead the crusade and trying to make changes would actually probably create more benefit. Mm -hmm. So why do you think their voices are silenced? It gets really complicated and it has to do with how adults think that children are going to report and how children actually report. Mm. So adults communicate with each other with direct communication. Right. You guys sent me a text of the address and the time to be here, and I responded, right? That's how adults communicate with each other, and we're really used to that. Mm -hmm. Adults kind of forget that children don't communicate that way. They are not going to set an appointment with you and sit down and say, I have some points to go over with you. (laughs) They're, They're just not going to do that. Children act out. Right. Children say things that are really, really weird. Mm -hmm. Um, Adults understandably get afraid to follow some of those things up. Let me give you an example. If you're a bishop and you have called someone in, a a teenager in for their, their youth bishop interview, you ask them about the law of chastity and they say something that's just a little weird, just a little off. That adult has to make a decision. Do I follow up on what they said and run the risk that now I'm going to be seen as the creepy guy asking this teenager questions about sex right? or do I let it go and not follow up on what they said and possibly have actually missed a disclosure that I could have coaxed out? I love that you bring that up because I do remember reading that children will say things indirectly about Mm -hmm. abuse if they're experiencing it themselves. Mm -hmm. Like they will bring up abuse in a different context like it happened to someone at school or they saw it on tv or you know a hypothetical situation for example and they'll watch how the adult reacts to it and they'll actually do this eight times Mm -hmm. until they disclose anything about what's happening to them yes and so you have to look at the way children are talking to you have to look at the way children play even Mm -hmm. it reflects in how they play with toys it's so it's it's not direct And so we have to be more aware. Yes. Um, A a great example of that is a child who they don't – kids don't know things in their family are weird, right? Like I'm sure you've had this experience. You grow up and you're like, only my family did that? Yes. Children (laughs) Children who are being abused have the exact same experience. And children really under age 10 talk about their home life in unfiltered ways. Mm -hmm. And so 
A child might say something like, oh, when Uncle John was in my bed, he told me the funniest joke. Right. The adult has to make a choice. Do I just let that go and, oh, Uncle John, I'm sure that's fine. Or do they risk, do they put some skin in the game and risk being accused of why are you, why are you poking around? Why are you accusing Uncle John? Why are you asking these questions? But following up for the sake of the kid, knowing that it could backfire on them personally, that is what we need more of. Right. To be honest, none of these crusades on on policies have really worked. Mm -hmm. The thing that works is adults in a child child's life willing to risk asking follow up questions when a kid says something weird. Or when they're talking about abuse that happened to someone else, right? Like right. trying to dig in with that kid, knowing full well that there are other people that might look at that conversation and be like, why, why are you asking those questions? Right. Because the questions could lead nowhere. Right. But then at least you know and you have peace of mind. Yeah. And the questions might lead to a series of eight conversations where the kid will finally disclose something. Exactly. There, there's also research that says children, not all of them, some children will deny that abuse happened to them even if there's photographic or video evidence of the abuse. Wow. Right? They can show them, here is the picture of this happening to you. Yeah. It's not me. Wow. Right? Because their denial mechanism is so strong. So one of the other things that victims do, children and adults alike, is they'll put a little bit of truth out there. They wait for the reaction. And if they either get scared or they don't like the reaction, I was kidding. Why? Are, don't take that serious. I, it was a joke, right? And so victims sort of have this terrible reputation of being liars is what victims get called. They they told a story and then they took it back. They're, they can't even sort out the truth. Well, that's what victims do mm -hmm. because they really, really want to put it out there. Right. And... They're terrified. So what's a better way we can respond if we're approached by a child that says something that's a little bit off mm -hmm. that might be a cause for a little bit more investigation, mm -hmm. question asking, building trust? Yeah. What's a proper way that an adult can respond? Yeah. So the adult has to keep that in mind and kind of play a long game with that kid. Because if the kid has just disclosed something they don't know is wrong, you probably aren't going to pull like a really great disclosure out of them at that moment. Right. They want to go play, mm -hmm. right? So the adult needs to keep that in mind and find ways to bring it back up a day later, mm -hmm. later that afternoon, a week later, whatever it is, um, and kind of try to track their answers. It means the adult has to pay attention and keep caring. Right. Every single adult I know says, if a child came to me and reported abuse, of course I would. I'd call CPS right then. I would save that child. But most adults have probably missed an abuse disclosure yeah. that they could have caught if they knew actually how to listen to the kid. I think an important point to mention, too, and correct me if this mm. is wrong, I think we also have to watch about how reactionary we can become <laughs> yes. when a child suggests something like this. Because children say weird mm -hmm. things all the time. And while on one hand it's easy to dismiss, if you want to have a little bit further investigation, you can't express anger to the child. Yeah. Like, well, why are you saying that about Uncle John? Or why are you, yes. you know, bringing Uncle John would to... never. Yes. Like, there can't be any defensiveness. There can't mm -hmm. be any outrage. There can't be any a kind of explosion of emotions because that in and of itself, even yeah. if you say all the right things, the tone in which it's delivered yep. is going to tell the kid this is not safe. I'm not going to bring this up again. The older the child, the more true that is. Like teenagers already don't want to talk about their lives in some ways. Right. How is school? Fine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if if a teenager says something to you that's weird enough that it sort of trips your wire of like this could be something, you have to be really careful. You cannot enthusiastically go after them with 20 questions. Right. They're they're going to back off because that they're teenagers, that's what they do. So making that much more of a process that disclosure is a, a process that happens long before the kid says anything where you're earning some trust with them, you're showing them I'm not I'm not overreacting. Right. I I want to know what's going on with you, but we're not we're not getting all emotional excited about it. Yeah. They need they need to feel your calm. 
Exactly. And this all plays into children feeling like they have trusted adults that they can go to in the yeah. first place to indirectly disclose information. Yep. And, you know, in most cases, we hope that that would be their parents that mm-hmm. were those trusted adults. And to just bring it back to the Church of Jesus mm-hmm. Christ of Latter-day Saints, something I love that the church emphasizes is a focus on family and having a healthy, happy yeah. family unit so that there are trusted adults so that children can go to. And I think that was one of your points in your article, mm-hmm. I Know How to Lower Church abuse rates by 75%, having a healthy home life obviously would lower child abuse rates. Yeah. So not all kids are at equal risk of being abused. Right. It, we say it can happen in any corner of society. It can happen in any socioeconomic status. And that's true. However, kids who live in a home where there's kind of a rotating parade of boyfriends, they're at far more risk than a kid who lives at home with their biological mother and father. Right. Any child who lives in a home with a non-related adult male is at greater risk. Yes. Um, and I know that's terrifying for, for people who might be listening who – there's a step family situation. And I am not saying that that step families are bad and non-related adults right. are always going to abuse them. I grew up in a step family. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and, and their risk is somewhat greater. So recognizing that our church emphasizes family more than any other church – Doctrinally, in the doctrine. Absolutely. (laughs) And and in the culture, Mm -hmm. right? And so there are more kids living with both biological parents in our church, and those kids are safer. How is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints already trying to prevent abuse? So there are so many things in our church that people don't recognize as actual protections. We think of them as really, really boring things, Mm. but they actually serve a double purpose of protecting kids. Like, no one thinks of word boundaries right? as a child protection. We think that's where they, they just tell me to go to church and that's just my word boundaries. If you were a person who had bad intention towards kids and you're in our church, you are told this is the ward that you're going to go to and your neighbors are going to be in that ward with you. And you can't um, expect just an easy excuse of, oh, I don't want to go to this ward anymore. You have to have a really good reason why you're going to go to a different ward. I alluded to it a little bit, our, our calling system. You don't get to volunteer yourself. I mean, people do. But, oh, I lo- I'd love to have a calling in primary or whatever. Right. But ultimately, the, the bishopric is in charge of that. If you had bad intention towards kids, you might wait a really long time for a calling that involves kids. Abusers aren't dumb. No. They they know how to manipulate systems. If they're going to walk into that system and realize, I might have to wait four, five, six years to be able to have easy access to kids. I'm I'm going to the church down the street. Right. So see, even think simple things like that are a protection that nobody even thinks about. Now, in terms of other churches, couldn't they just do things like background checks in order to see who has poor intentions and who doesn't? Fabulous question. Um, let me ask you. What is a background check? It's something to check your criminal history. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, And how far back do you think they go? I actually don't know. Um, Do you think that that criminal history includes allegations against them or is it only convictions? I would think only convictions. Yeah. So there is our problem. Mm. Um, The vast majority of childhood sexual abuse is not reported in a timely enough manner that it falls under the statute of limitations. So it used to be, before about five years ago, laws have been changing in the last five years, thankfully. Mm -hmm. Before about five years ago, the generous states were giving people until age 26 to report. And if you didn't report by 26, you you can't make a criminal case against someone. Mm. The, The statute has run out. Right. Do you know the average age that people start talking about their sexual abuse? I think I remember from the article it was 51, yeah. which is well after the statute of limitations has run out. Yes. Today, there are a few states that have no statute of limitations on this crime, right? which is lovely. People in those states have a chance, but that's mm-hmm. not – most Americans don't live under that. Right. If you even wait till you're 30, you aren't going to put something on that person's criminal record. Mm. So this person abused you. They can walk into whatever church. That church can background check them all they want. There's nothing to find. And I think there was a case of this happening in a Southern Baptist church, correct, where a pastor had been accused. He was taken to court and he was convicted. Mm -hmm. And even after all that, it wouldn't have shown up on his background check. Yeah. 
There are so many. So that particular case, um, there's a difference between going to court criminally and going to court civilly. Right. Right. So in theory, in some of these states, there's sort of a little wiggle room to get a civil case through. I actually mm -hmm. took my childhood church to court for abuse and we went to civil court. Mm -hmm. um, there's no criminal marks on the person who did this case. He would pass a background check today. The problem with background checks, like I hear it already in my brain. People would say, well, gosh, I've heard of cases where, where people submit to a background check and we find out that they really are these terrible abusers. They already have a record. Isn't it worth doing to just keep that guy out? And yeah, it probably is. Mm -hmm. But here's the problem. When you tell most people, oh, he has a clean background check, they think that means that he's safe. Right. And it doesn't mean that. No. All it means is there's no conviction. Right. It doesn't even mean there's no charges. <laughs> it right. means there's no conviction. And the reality is almost no one gets convicted for this crime. Mm. So doing a background check, you're saying to parents, hey, we checked this guy out and he is safe to be around your children. They don't think of it in terms of, oh, this just means there hasn't been a criminal conviction. Right. They think, oh, my kid is okay with them. Right. And they lower their guard. We could talk about this topic forever. I'm sure you could. I know I could. And if you want to hear more points about how the church actively works to prevent and stop abuse, you can check out the link below in the description to the article, I Know How to Lower Church Abuse Rates by 75% from Public Square Magazine, written by Jennifer Roach. If you'd like a part two, please let us know in the comments below, and we'll be sure to talk about any other topics that you have questions about in depth, and we'll have our beautiful guest back here. Thanks so much, and have a wonderful day. We'll see you next time.